We are live with Scott Massey. Scott, are you ready to talk? I am. Thank you for having me. Scott Massey assisted in the design of a NASA-funded automated hydroponic plant growth chamber with the ultimate goal of growing sustainable food in space colonies under Dr. Kerry Mitchell. This inspired him to found Heliponics, formerly HydroGrow LLC. Scott Massey, welcome to the talk. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Your talk is called Revolutionizing Agriculture with Household Appliances. And I love this because uh, very easy to understand. You have kind of ICE 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0 uh, as you describe it in the opening of your talk. And you show us a picture of just slabs of ice out in a, in a river somewhere. And then you show us as the 2.0 ice, uh, the concept of refrigeration. And then the 3.0 was when you actually had this giant expensive machine called a refrigerator in your house. Uh, for the ultimate of convenience. And, and frankly, um, you're doing the same thing with hydroponics and uh, the, the, the real crowning jewel of your talk was actually, it was almost like a hydroponic refrigerator. Uh, my words, not yours, but it, you had this light, you had something that looked a similar size as a refrigerator. And what a great way to solve the issue of the food deserts that are plaguing many of our inner cities as well as rural areas. So uh, Scott, please take us behind the talk. Yeah, absolutely. If you look at uh, kind of the limitations and then what ultimately caused the growth of the ice industry, it's virtually identical to agriculture. In the 1800s, we got ice once a year in the winter when it was cold enough for it to freeze. And agriculture isn't so much different today. We farm once a year when the season allows it. And if you're out of that seasonal availability or some sort of climate change aspect happens, uh, you're not farming. Now, farming 2.0, as I like to call it, is the industrialization of agriculture, bringing it indoor, massive, multi-million, sometimes uh, tens of million dollar uh, facilities that can grow nonstop year round, just like the ice factories. But ice factories were ultimately disrupted through decentralization. And by that, I mean the refrigerator, the personal ice factory in every home. And that's exactly what we're doing with hydroponics. We are building consumer hydroponic appliances that can be simplified down to Keurig for food. I started this company called Heelponics my senior year. We sell consumers with residential hydroponic devices called grow pods and recurring monthly subscriptions of seed pods mailed directly to their door so they can have clean, fresh produce in their home that tastes better and it's better for them. Well, this is interesting because um, I remember, this is probably, probably about eight years ago, I actually got one of these kits and it was about, I think it was about 50 or $70 and I had those little pods and I put them in and we grew a couple of heads of lettuce maybe and then it just kind of didn't work quite as well anymore. And again, this was eight years ago. So this mm -hmm. isn't super new, but I, it is uh, becoming much more, um, uh, much more quality controlled and, and I, I'm sure the bugs are, are bugged out of it to a much higher degree. I've actually been able to tour some of these indoor greenhouses, hydroponic farms. Uh, I've seen it. I know the climate control breakthroughs and the, the water drip irrigation breakthroughs are a lot more than they used to be. And I have a little bit of familiarity, probably enough to get myself in trouble. So, um, Scott, what I, I love, that's, that's kind of my uh, layman's uh, evaluation of really the last eight or nine years. What would you say to that? And what do you think that the last eight or nine years look like uh, from your vantage point? And then what are we looking at maybe five years from now? Will we have one of these machines in our homes that are going to be a lot more available maybe five years from now? Yeah, uh, it's actually happening now, so a lot sooner uh, than later. And I think you could almost describe the last 10 years as kind of a, a shakeout period. You just now have LEDs and microcontrollers becoming cheap enough that if you wanted to produce a device that was IoT enabled, meaning it's connected to the internet at scale, that's internet really just IoT, about now yeah. been possible to do so. And uh, I'm, I'm very glad you brought up uh, your own experience with the consumer <laughs> residential desktop units. Uh, yeah. And those kind of fall into the same camp as the bread makers of the world. Every Christmas, bread makers sell out like crazy. 
And if you look at the projections of these companies, it's a billion dollar market opportunity, each one of them, because they predict this massive subscription recurring revenue. But what they don't account for is people getting tired of it. It requiring almost more labor than it would to just go to the grocery store and putting it in your closet and probably never touching it again a few months later. Uh, what we have here is kind of the culmination of both small, a dishwasher sized appliance, but that's still able to yield a full head of greens on a daily basis. So it's kind of the small usefulness uh, kind of intersection, finally making this available for the first time. A full but, head really, of greens on a daily basis? Yes, sir. So I, through heard, our that, I heard that correctly. Yeah, through our utility patent, we were able to hold 50 plants inside of our device. If you span uh, the growth cycle of about 30 days over those ports, as long as you're replacing one pod for every head that you're harvesting, you will have a daily harvest every day in your home. So I'm going to go from pod to pod, maybe harvest a leaf every day, that, that kind of thing? Or Oh, or I'm talking a full different? head of lettuce, full head of spinach. I mean, lunch and dinner taken care of, at least for myself. I'm not vegan, but I eat like one. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to reward myself with uh, more and more salads. So I, I love this idea. Um, I guess where um, let, let's talk about the idiot proof uh, effect, <laughs> because, you know, eight years ago, I buy this groovy little thing and say, hey, honey, we're going to have salad. And, and it, you know, it kind of worked. Mm -hmm. And it just it just kind of either burned out or I had to replace the pod or it just stopped working as well and whatnot. So so what what measures um, have you done when when you test this out on maybe regular people in the market? What what are some of the things that that the rest of us uh, Homer Simpsons out there do to uh, get in the way of this working as well as you would like? And what what are some of the fixes for that? Uh, I'd say the dilemma here is everyone says keep your product simple, and by that they mean keep the user experience simple. And to achieve that, you need to have a pretty sophisticated IoT platform to make sure that all processes are eliminated. What really separates us is that this is essentially a miniature greenhouse. It's airtight. It's actually separated from the environment. If you grow plants outdoors, there's all sorts of pathogens, and I'm sorry, even indoors in the open air, things like pythium, little pathogens in the air, like viruses that make people sick can make those plants sick as well. Uh, so what we've done is really taken the human element outside of this and automated every aspect of it. I and love it. whatever so it, it's going to interact with Alexa or, or something, yeah. you know, some internet of thing type, type thing. And then all we do, it's climate controlled. Mm -hmm. And then we just open the thing up, take a whole pod because there's 30 or 50 pods. So we take a whole pod, which is a whole head of lettuce. And then we, we don't have to pay, uh, you know, $8 at the, at the salad works down the street. We've got our salad right there in the house. Yeah, and especially in this age of uh, romaine lettuce E. coli outbreaks. Oh, well, yeah, that just happened. I forgot yeah. about that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, that is, uh, that is pretty amazing and i'm looking forward to this i don't know if i can sign up to to be a test uh, <laughs> test person out there but uh, i mean how, how did this get started for you scott how, i mean for me i had a great introduction to the technology working on the nasa research study at purdue but it ended there it was an introduction to the technology no real market opportunity beyond that uh the summer before my senior year at purdue i had a bit of a bait and switch experience with a larger construction company, I uh, was promised a job at the career fair to work in Hawaii as a project manager. And I naively <laughs> accepted that and kind of accepted their uh, do not worry about the to be determined stamp on my location. Uh, a few months after not hearing back from my HR manager, I was actually reassigned to build Section 8 government housing in El Paso along the border to Juarez, Mexico. And it was, it was a rough rough uh, little space down there. Um, but what I saw for the first time was a real food desert. I mean, so much so that there just wasn't fresh food options. It was an actual desert. So there was enough uh, poor uh, soil needed to grow or even water available that if you wanted to grow in a backyard garden. And halfway through working on that project, kind of thinking about the problems and then also seeing these government appliances that were still functional being thrown away from the Section 8 housing, it kind of clicked in my head. Hydroponics, the whole benefit is you take the soil away. It's not constrained by any geographic limitations. And that's when I realize these appliances that they can just so easily replace 
could be the opportunity to put farms in homes across the U.S. And when I started to think about the possibility of changing the diet of people even in these Section 8 residences who more often than not are disproportionately obese and ultimately have Medicare uh, expenses that we as the taxpayers end up paying, if we could just turn the obesity diet around and give them the fresh produce that they need, if we could prevent obesity-related health complications, a device like this would pay for itself in months months if you look at how much people are paying for health care and it's only getting more expensive it's outrageous talk universe i want you to listen to what scott's done because i mean this this is fascinating because this is the ultimate lemons to lemonade <laughs> the guy thought he was building homes in hawaii <laughs> and uh, didn't quite work out that way and and all the challenges just in the environment that you saw uh it's really fascinating to look and see what you took from your own experience and, and just practical problems and challenges and you are solving every single one of those right here, right now. Do you ever look back and, and just, I mean, were you trying to, to, to uh, do the best with the cards that you were dealt or did it just work that way or did you wake up one day and, and realize how it all clicked together? Yeah, you know, before that summer, I, I wasn't really set out on construction. I applied to almost every major vertical farm in the U.S. and was rejected. And it kind of disappointed me to see that. And I found out that these farms have reduced agricultural energy rates. They pay about 90% less for energy. And when you have indoor lights, pumps, their energy bill is insanely high. Without these subsidies, many of these farms would be very little or not profitable at all. So I think the realization that it needed to be broken up and there needed to be a new innovative design that we could at least patent that would reduce the energy kind of gave me the right environment and the drive to get myself out of that environment uh, to really found the company. Well, we've been enjoying this uh, conversation with Scott Massey. His talk is called Revolutionizing Agriculture with Household Appliances. And we're going to pivot over to you now, Talk Universe, because it is time in just a moment for the Blitz Round. And we're back with Scott Massey. It is time for the Blitz Round. I'm going to ask Scott a series of either or questions related to the preparation and performance of his recent talk. Scott, are you ready to go? I am. First question, were you invited to speak or did you apply? I was invited. Are you a memorizer, improviser, or blender? Blender. How did that serve you? Uh, pretty well, I thought. I, I'm not the type that I really want to stick to a script. I like being able to at least gauge an audience reactions. Uh, people are surprisingly good at displaying confusion or some sort of facial reaction if you don't say something right and need to repeat yourself. And I think it's very important you're able to pivot and adapt to these different environments and audiences. Yeah, well, what is a, a tip, tool, or technique that helped you? Slowing down, realizing that every person in the audience is just as equal as the people in the first row. That if you need to pause, that's fine. It actually helps deliver a point probably with even more, uh, I would say, force, and the audience probably resonates with it uh, a lot better. And it's awkward to uh, practice the pause, mm -hmm. yet it makes a big difference when you do it. Did you Absolutely. find that you had to uh, kind of check yourself and force yourself to kind of unlearn the normal way that you would speak and, and actually pause purposefully and practice that and nail it on stage? Uh, I was really fortunate to have great coaches that uh, prepped me for this environment. I'm, I'm the type that if I'm ever a little nervous or want to end a talk sooner, I'll talk a lot faster. And people have a tendency to just kind of nod and not really, yes, I understand what you're saying, but yes, you're talking pretty fast. And uh, I think just learning to slow down uh, was probably one of the best keys I had taught to me. Scott, were you an opener, were you a closer, or were you in between? Uh, I think I was right in between. There's about nine talks that day. It was a pretty full day. Yeah, yeah. Well, what advice do you have for other people kind of in the middle of the sandwich there? Hmm. For me, as someone who was starting a business and had done a lot of business pitches before that and kind of anticipated it to be something similar to that, take the business out of it for a second. Uh, don't worry about the margins. Don't worry about the bottom line. Just focus on the why. Who are you and why are you doing this? 
And I think just being able to hit that kind of core value of who and what you're doing uh, will really resonate with just the average person. Because to be honest, the business pitch really is kind of boring when you talk to normal people, when you start talking about numbers at the end of the day. What was the uh, most unexpected, strange, or just plain weird thing that happened during or right before your talk? Uh, you know, I'd say I wasn't really expecting to have made as such good of friends with the other TEDx speakers as I did. Uh, we spent a great amount of time with each other before and after the talk. It was a bit of a, a whole week set up by Wabash College, and I had a great time, and I, I really wasn't expecting it to be that much fun. Definitely is. And we've been enjoying a very fun conversation with Scott Massey. His talk is called Revolutionizing Agriculture with Household Appliances. You can go to our show notes page if you don't want to type all that into YouTube and we will have a link so you can watch this thing. You want to see these, these uh, appliances and, um, and gizmos that he is coming up with and they're going to revolutionize our lives and just uh, a short amount of time. Uh, you can also go to his website at heliponics.com, H-E-L-I-P-O-N-I-X, heliponics.com, and we will have a link uh, to heliponics.com on the website as well. And we were going to be right back in just a moment for Scott Massey's final word of advice. And we're back. It's time for the final word of advice from Scott Massey. What is it? Do not ask permission. I uh, asked a lot of people if this was a good idea, and I had a lot of people say, yeah, sure, and a lot of people say, what? No, absolutely not. And I think so many people are biased by their own perspectives or what they consider the limitations of technologies at a time that what I wanted to create was not technologically possible yet, that I as an engineer had a lot of design work to do to bring this forward. And had I asked people permission, should I be doing this? Am I doing this right? How would you do it? Every step of the way, although it's important to get that feedback, should not be defining on whether or not you're willing to take a leap and start your own company and business. Because if you look for people uh, to say it's a bad idea, you, you will find people who will tell you it's a bad idea. Well, Scott Massey, thank you so much for carving out time in your busy schedule to come on the talk today and share your wisdom with Talk Universe. Thank you for having me.